you haven't put a name on the wall over here or more than one name on the wall, uh, Brother Dave Harris comes in. The first thing he does is walk over and he prays over the wall. And we are uh, believing God for great things. Uh, amen. amen. How many pray and don't believe God's going to answer it? Ah, we pray sometimes, and I'm not sure we believe God's actually going to answer the prayer. Ah, see, I'm expecting the people on this wall to be saved. If that's you, say amen. Amen, amen. amen. Yesterday, while we were cleaning up for the, um, while we were cleaning up from the yard sale out here, and and taking stuff to Goodwill and all the things that we do to get rid of stuff and. Uh, a neighbor who was visiting came over. He said he'd been in Afghanistan and that he was back and he said, hey, I had been an atheist. And he told Miss Barb, he said, I want to meet Jesus. So Miss Barb, she's in tears, she's crying. She brings him to me. I got an armload of stuff. And I said, Tim, Mr. Campbell, come here a minute. I said, take this man in the church and share Christ with him and then lead him to find him. You keep praying in faith. This man, we got him hooked up with a church. He lives in Portland. We're expecting God to do great and mighty things in his life. If you believe that, say amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, we're not going to talk about the wall today, although we might a little bit. Last couple of weeks, we've been talking about a wall, uh, building a wall around the presence of God in your life. Uh, today, we're going to step just a little bit differently, uh, but we're going to do what I believe the Lord would have us do. Uh, and hopefully you can receive from God's word, and hopefully I can present it correctly. Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6. If you've been in church at all in your life, you've probably heard about the armor of God, amen? amen. Well, we're going to revisit the armor of God today. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10, stand with me, if you will, for the reading of God's word. Peter's the first one to jump up. Good to see you, man. Good to have you back with us. Uh, and, and all the youngins. <laughs> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Brother Tim Nichols, will you bless the reading of the word? Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. How many has heard this scripture? Heard messages preached? Brother Mark's preached about 700 messages on this scripture Sunday school we've done all that but we're going to revisit it for a little while this morning and so I, I ask you this question in in honesty when you think of the armor of God how many think of that Roman soldier armor yeah right how many think of that knight's armor right because that's that's what we've always been taught or shown Micah you got me hooked up we think of the armor of God as the Roman soldier's armor or, or a knight's armor. And, and we, we, we do this because we picture it in our mind. And we've always been taught that way, kind of. Uh, I remember as kids, my mom doing flannel graphs. 
you know, the armor of God in flannel graph. And then it got, you know, coloring pages. And then we did those um, uh, transparencies, I guess you call them. And now we're on the screen, right? And, and here we are. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Why would God use a picture of the enemy's armor, and Rome was an enemy of God in those days, maybe still today, uh, and certainly in the future. Why would God use a picture of the enemy's armor and then say to us, put on the armor of God? Why would God literally take a picture of the enemy's army and then say, put on the armor of God and have us picture what the enemy wears? Dave Gutierrez, I, I'm quoting him, said it like this. That's the equivalent of God saying to the people of Israel, look at the tool of the Amorites and use those for offerings and for sacrifices. God doesn't do that. God doesn't tell us to use the enemy's weapons or even the enemy's armor to put on for ourselves. He says to put on the armor of God. So let me go back over a little bit of this scripture with you and then we'll move on from there. But that's kind of what we picture in our brains. But in this scripture, as we start, here's what it says. He says, be strong in the Lord, not in the might of yourself, not in the might of your armor, but be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and in the power of his might. Now, this picture tells me that I am to be strong in myself, that I am to be literally strong, rigid. That guy's got like the six packs or the eight pack or, or whatever that is. I've got more like five gallon jugs, but, but that's, but he literally, literally says that for we are to be in the power of his might. Then he says, put on the whole armor of God that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For we fight not against flesh and blood. We fight not against flesh and blood. That armor says we are fighting against flesh and blood. That armor says that I'm going to battle in my flesh. Now we know that, the, that we do battle physically, but understand this, and if you disagree, that's okay, but understand this. All physical battles have a spiritual backing to them. Everything you fight in the physical has a spiritual application to it. Every single battle. So when we're fighting it in the flesh, we're not fighting in the might of God. When we fight every battle that we fight, when we fight it in the fleshly realm, we're not using the armor of God, but we're using the armor of man to try to overcome the schemes of the devil. Still with me? Somebody say amen or something. Thank you. For we fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and rulers of the darkness in high places. Franklin Graham called today to pray for President Trump as a day that we pray for President Trump. I'm asking you. Some people say, well, you know, the Bible tells us to pray for our leaders. And if we call a national day of prayer for our leaders, pray for our leaders. Moving on. We fight against powers, principalities, and rulers, or darkness in high places or heavenly places. He said, stand with the belt of truth, a breastplate of righteousness. Does that look like a breastplate of righteousness? Hmm, let's move on. A shield of faith. And I love this one because here's what, you know, you, we, we've done this, right? We've all seen the shield of the armor of God, the big shield. But a shield is tangible. You can see a shield. Faith is not tangible. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And yet in my mind, I'm expecting God to put up this big giant shield to fight with. And the reality is that's not a spiritual uh, shield. A spiritual shield cannot be seen. It's a shield of faith that, you know what? Even though all hell is breaking loose around me, God is still going to overcome this. God is still going to deliver. God is still going to set free. I got to go on. Y'all are too quiet. Bad when first service is louder than you guys. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Now watch this. 
Here's what your, your text says. It says that you are to take the sword of the Spirit. And we make it as a picture of a sword. But he gives us a hint that it's spiritual, not physical. Which is the Word of God. Which is the Word of God. So why am I picturing in my mind and following that I am to fight with a physical sword when he said the Word of God is what I'm supposed to fight with? The Word of God is what I'm supposed to to fight with now that doesn't mean i'm going to go out and argue scripture with everybody on planet earth but it does mean this when the enemy says this comes against me or that when it comes against me my job is to see what god says about it and fight the powers and principalities of the enemy with what god's word says instead of trying it in my physical realm which i'm not capable of doing y'all wake up in a minute i hope Fighting is spiritual. And if you want to know one of the problems of the churches today, I know we're not supposed to say that, right? But it's because we're fighting in the physical instead of the spiritual. We're trying to find a way to overcome what's coming against us rather than taking it to God's throne and giving it to Him. I want us to look at something. I'm only going to look at one part of this, and this is for this reason. I want you to dig in the rest. I want you to dig. I want you to learn. I want you to grow. And you can't do that if I'm giving it all to you. I want us to look at the breastplate of righteousness from a spiritual standpoint. Can we do that? We're going back to Exodus. Mark knew I wouldn't stay in the New Testament forever, right? We've been talking from Exodus 25 to 40 how God gives specific instructions. Exodus chapter 28, Exodus 28, beginning with verse 15. I'll give you a second to get there. Exodus 28, beginning with verse 15. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold and of blue and of purple and of scarlet. And of fine twined linen shall thou make it. We want to fight the enemy with a breastplate made of brass or made of steel or something that we can withstand. When God tells them to make a breastplate, he says make it out of cloth. Royal cloth. We'll get there in a minute. Verse 16. Four square it shall be doubled a span shall be the length thereof and a span shall be the breadth thereof and thou shalt set in the settings of stone even four rows of stones the first row of stones should be sardis you ought to look that one up and actually dig into that that is an amazing study on sardis a topaz and a carbuncle this shall be the first row second row shall be an emerald a sapphire and a diamond the third row a lazure an agate and an amethyst And the fourth row, a beryl and an onyx and a jasper. And they shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve. According to their names, like the engravings of a signet. You know what a signet is? That's a ring that has an emblem on it of the king or of the leader. And when you put that in, that says, I'm speaking for the king. Everyone with his name shall be they according to the twelve tribes. And they shall make into the breastplate chains at the end of wreathen gold work of pure gold. And they shall make upon the breastplate two rings of gold and shall put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings which are at the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two wreathen chains thou shalt fasten in the two ouches, and put them in the shoulder piece of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them under the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is the side of the ephod inward. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and thou shalt make them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart thereof, 
over against the other coupling thereof above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof under the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue. And it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord. Exact detail on how to make this. He gave exact detail on how to make this breastplate. He said, I want you to make it out of royal material. I want you to make it to the point that when you strap it on, it becomes part of your undergarment, your ephod. I want it to literally become part of who you are. Now, right, I'm a New Testament Christian, so all I'm thinking is that thing ain't going to protect nobody. But it's not me fighting in the physical. It's God fighting in the spiritual. And when he tells us to put on the armor of God, if we always see it as that we are protecting ourselves, then we miss the boat of what God is telling us. Watch this. Stay with me. I think I've lost some of you already. 1 Peter 2, 4, and 5. And as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to a holy priesthood to offer sacrifice, spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The enemy wants you to believe that you are not of royal birth. The enemy wants you to believe that if you put on the breastplate to fight against him and you put on a brass breastplate and you don't put on the breastplate of God, that you literally will be fighting against him in a better way. But here's what God said about the breastplate. God said, I want you to make it out of linen cloth. I want you to make it where it fits tight against you. And when you come into God, you're coming in. There was a high priest then. Christ is our high priest. We don't need a high priest. The veil was torn from top to bottom. We have access to the throne room of God, and we ought to be fighting every battle we fight in the throne room of God with a spiritual armor rather than in the physical trying to defeat the enemy on our own. Amen. Hey, see? The enemy wants you to believe, and I can hear in my spirit people saying, well, we're not a uh, high priest. It just said that we are a royal priesthood. Until you believe that, you're not going to overcome the enemy because you're fighting in yourself. And you've got to decide and determine in your heart that you are of royal blood. That you know what? I put a signet ring on and it says Jesus Christ on it. And when I ask God to do something that is not contradictive to his word, he literally says, pray like this. Our Father, put my name on it. Take Take the authority that God has given you. Stop fighting in the natural and begin to take the authority that God has given you and begin to say, you know what? This is not my battle. I have power of attorney to use the name of Jesus Christ. I have power. Why do you think Jesus said pray like this? He didn't say pray your father. He said, pray our Father. He said, add my name to your prayer. Because I'll agree with you when it doesn't contradict my word. I'll agree with you when it doesn't contradict my word. Revelation 5.10 says you're a royal priesthood. If I can't get you to see that, then you're probably going to miss the whole boat. When do you become what God called you to be? When do we start walking in the authority of that God has given us rather than begging God while we stand here behind a feeble armor that in our minds we've built when he says if you want to put on a breastplate of judgment or righteousness mm, we'll get there we got time right I'm not looking at my watch so we got time
can I tell you how to put on a breastplate of righteousness that will defeat the enemy? Can I tell you how he did it? He said, you take 12 stones and you mark them for every tribe. They have to be inlaid in your breastplate. And before you go in, and I love this in the scripture. I love this. Here's what he said. He didn't say that they were to remain on the breastplate. He said that when Aaron goes in to the Holy of Holies, when he steps into the throne room of God, that the tribes of Israel will be on his heart. We wonder why God's not answering prayers. It's because we're not taking the tribes of sweet home. We're not taking the perigens. We're not taking the holders. We're not taking the Arisons to the throne room of God. See, I'll use this as an example. Don't get mad at me, Manny. But Manny can run to the throne room of God with Megan and with Jesse, his daughters. And he can, they're bared on his heart. But he didn't take, if he doesn't take the breastplate that has me and you on his heart, he's not using the full potential to fight the enemy until we do that. It literally said that the priest, when he went into the throne room of God, he had on a breastplate and that the breastplate literally was bound to his heart. He took his friends and his neighbors before the throne of God, church, if we're ever going to see God move. We're going to have to take the lost and dying world to the throne room of God. We're going to have to make our enemies a priority. We're going to have to make our family a priority. We're going to have to make our neighbors a priority. If you want a breastplate of righteousness, your righteousness comes through Christ. Would you agree? Christ had compassion on a lost and dying world. See, I've been fighting this battle all wrong, Miss Diana. I've been fighting it like I'm supposed to conquer the world, but what I'm supposed to do is take this breastplate of God and place it on, not the one that we paint in the pictures, but the one, Micah, show the picture. I'm sorry. I, I get ahead of myself. He's got me a picture, I think. There's so much more to this that I'm not going to get into. He said, when you go into battle... Go in with a linen breastplate and step into the throne room of God to fight. You say, I'm not fighting God. No, we're fighting the enemy. But you're not going to defeat the schemes of the devil if you're fighting in your own flesh. He literally showed them a breastplate. And he said, this is the breastplate of judgment. Now, I know that was high priest, right? So let me just get to another point. He said the breastplate never, ever, ever be without the Urim and the Thummim. Two little rocks. The urine, or Urim and the Thummim. I know. The English language is hard for me. All languages are hard for me. Urim means light. And the Bible tells me that Jesus is the light of the world. The Bible tells me that it's not my righteousness, but his righteousness. And until I put on the light of Christ and never let it off, I will never fight the battle correctly. And that's not my salvation, but that is literally going to the throne room of God and believing God for what he said he would do. That's taking the authority and taking the boldness and the holiness and saying to God Almighty, you said. Thuman means perfection. I'll never be perfect. But Christ is. The Holy Spirit that lives in me is. And until I learn to fight my battles with the full armor of God as a royal priesthood. Let me share with you how I fight my battles. You ready? God, I'm asking you to protect my children until they come in to you. I'm asking you to put angels about them. I'm asking you to keep them safe. I'm asking you to guard them, put on the armor of God about them, put angels, protect them, and all those things. And God says, why don't you bring them to me? 
let me handle this. Why do you keep trying to do my job? Why do you keep battling within yourself? If you will earnestly bring me to them and say, God, I give them to you. I can't do this, but I'm putting on the breastplate, and they're on my heart, and I'm giving you my heart today, and I'm putting on your armor, and I'm going to fight by giving it to you, and I'm going to believe you for them. And I believe we can hear him say, finally. Because I'm trying to save their body, and he's trying to save their eternal soul. I'm fighting to grow a church, and he's fighting to grow a kingdom. And I'm looking at things from a physical perspective. And the spiritual perspective of this one piece of the armor. Spiritual perspective says that I am to have a burden for a lost and dying world. That I am literally to put Christ on. If I ruffle your feathers, let them be ruffled. But if all you ever do is go online and bash everybody on planet earth that disagrees with you, you don't love them. And until you love them, God is not going to move on your behalf or theirs. Until you literally say, I'm taking every one of the tribe... I know they hurt you. I know they're evil. But we can't solve that. But God can. And we're fighting battles in the physical. And we're putting on a physical armor. When God said it's supposed to be spiritual. He said it right here. That you are not fighting flesh and blood. But you are fighting powers and principalities. He says for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. He didn't give me a Roman soldier's armor. He gave me royal blood to wear the priest's robe and to step into the throne room and to carry the lost and dying world in and expect him to move on their behalf. He gave us boldness and authority. He literally said... I give you the authority to use my name. When my dad passed away, my brother had power of attorney. Whatever my brother signed was my dad's signature. Period. In front of the court, in front of the lawyers, in front of the judges, in front of the law, it was as good as my dad's signature. And he said, I give you authority. And yet I put on this armor to protect myself. Because I'm like a Roman soldier. You know they lost, right? Just throwing that out there. And God said, I want you to stop looking at it from a physical worldly perspective. And I want you to see it from a spiritual perspective. What are you going through today? Because right now you're probably, if you're like me, seeing it from a physical or a mental perspective. What's God's perspective on it? Man's perspective, Lazarus dead. Jesus' perspective, he's taking a nap. Man's perspective, you'll never be forgiven for what you've done. Jesus' perspective, the light, Urim and Thummim, the perfection and the light, the righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. He says, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? You see, church, if we're not careful, we end up with a Western culture mental mindset or a Western culture physical mindset. But when we begin to see God's word for how it was written, here's what you will find. You want to fight your battle? Get it to the throne room. 
You want to fight your battle? Take your neighbors to the throne room. Put on the 12 stones. Every single one of them. Put them on. Take the perfection and righteousness of Christ. I can't step into the throne room of God in my righteousness. It's as filthy rags. But I can step into the throne room with the righteousness and perfection of Christ Jesus. He was showing them that in Exodus 28, that you're going to have a light and you're going to have a perfection that when you put this on, you will have authority to speak to God instead of letting the enemy run amok in our lives. My daddy's king of kings. Pastor, I'm just going through, I'm just going through. You know what? If I told you the truth, what I would actually say to you, you're going to keep going through it because you won't step out of it. Until you put air in the tire, it's never going to roll. Pastor, you just don't know how difficult. I do know how difficult it is. I've been addicted. I've been homeless. I know. But I also know the God that delivers. And I know that when I begin to put on what he has for me to put on, everything changes. Now I'm heartbroken for the young man that ran through our fence and cost us $1,500. All he needs is Jesus. He'd probably want to come down and rake the gravel and level them out if he had Jesus in his heart. The guys that have cheated you, Dave, just pray for them. God will do the rest. And I know there's been a ton of them, believe me. I know as much business as you've done. But we have to put on the breastplate of Christ, the breastplate of his righteousness. And we have to stop fighting battles that we're not supposed to be fighting. I'm supposed to take it to the throne room. That's why he gave me access. That's why he gave you authority. The world would tell you you're not a child of God. The world would tell you you're not a princess. The world would say princesses don't wear purple. Actually, I read that. It says it, they do. Notice what he said, and I'm closing. He said that the breastplate became one with the, with the ephod, which is a very tight-fitting undergarment. And he said it became one. When we begin to truly put on God's armor with the compassion of Christ in our lives, we're going to see God begin to move in a mighty way. When I watch Miss Barb, I don't even know if she's in here or not, I watched her tremble so bad she couldn't even share Jesus with a man because she was so excited that he wanted Christ. That's when God's going to move. Not when we try to defend ourselves, but when we put on the righteousness of God. You want an armor that will stay in the attack of the enemy? How many families are under attack? Can I tell you what to do? If you put your hands down. Can I tell you what to do? Take everyone that's come against your family and put them on your breastplate. Take every one of them and put them on there. And step into the throne room of God with them on your heart, a burden for their souls. And watch what God will do for the ones you are taking. Not just the ones that you need God to touch. But when he begins to change lives of others. When you begin to put on the breastplate that literally says your heart is for every tribe. Every tribe. Not just the one you're from. Every tribe. It changes things. 
when you look at every situation through the righteousness of Christ, through the light and perfection of Christ, then you step into the throne room, you step in with more power and authority than you've ever stepped in with. Because God can move mountains. But you've got to understand you're not fighting flesh and blood. You are fighting powers and principalities. And you're not going to do that in the physical realm. It has to be spiritual. Can we give God praise in the house? Stand with me if you will. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've walked away, salvation is what you need more than anything, and we want you to know Christ, period. If you're not sure, we want you to know Christ. But for those families that are here that know Christ, but there's a war and a struggle going on, and you've been fighting every way you know, I'm asking you to consider putting on the righteousness the breastplate of righteousness and turning them over to God, putting them on your heart and fighting in the realm that you were meant to fight in, the spiritual realm, not the physical. Bring them to this altar and let God be God. Father, I feel like I fail you so many times. I feel like I couldn't preach my way out of a wet paper bag. I don't even know why you called me. But I will stand here every week and present to honor you. And I pray that the light of Christ and the perfection of the sweet Holy Ghost does the work and begins to stir people's hearts to see what we need to do to move and fight against the schemes of the enemy and that we need to be able to turn it over to you and let you handle it. God, I pray that we would learn to put on a spiritual armor, not a physical one. Touch your people today in your precious name. The altars are open going to ask you if you have a burden, bring it to the Lord.